So we've got three, three speakers today, uh, relatively short talks, uh, but hopefully they provide a bit of breadth um, on some really exciting concepts in the biosciences. Um, I'll introduce each one, um, yes, each one before they, before they talk, and, um, and we will go from there. So our first speaker is uh, Yolanta, Yolanta Bianarovica, uh, protein engineer at University of Nottingham, uh, she's an ambassador for the RSB. She does an awful lot of um, bioscience engagement work, and she's going to talk to us, unsurprisingly, about spider silks. Hi, everybody. My name is Yolanta Venerovic, and I'm a PhD researcher in industrial biotechnology. I'm based at the University of Nottingham. And today, I'll take you on a very quick journey about synthetic spider silks. So I will start with the riddle. So what do these images of a facial moisturizer, a dress, and a skateboard, what could these things possibly have in common? Well, the trick is they all made of spider silk. Now, spider silk has, has been fascinating for many people for a really long time. Spider silk is a protein and it's a nature's strongest fiber. In fact, it is stronger than bullet, bulletproof Kevlar, which is a bulletproof vest material. Spiders spin up to seven different types of silks, and they're used for prey capture, for egg wrapping, and even flying. Uh, silk, silk is uh, an elastic material, which means that it can stretch up to four times its original length before it breaks. And it is much more impressive uh, property compared to most artificial materials. Unlike plastic and other petrochemicals, silk is biodegradable, which means that it will eventually decompose. And most importantly, from a biologist's perspective, silk is not immunogenic, which means that when spider silk is inserted into a living body, it does not cause inflammation. Now, all these properties make silk a very appealing material for medical applications. So what's the problem? So the main reason why we don't have spider silk clothes and face creams available at my local ASDEM is because spiders can't be found to produce enough silk for all desired applications. I like silkworms that happily make silk while sat in a box, one on top of another. Spiders are territorial and, and very cannibalistic, and they just don't like having other spiders around. Now, scientists still want to make lots and lots of silk, and to do so, we use microorganisms. And it's the same process as you would use yeast for raising bread or making beer. Synthetic biology allows us to modify the genetic code of microbes so that they are programmed to make silk totally spider-free. Now, if you're like me and like knowing how things work, here's a very quick story for you. So first things first, we need to find a spider and not just any old spider, but someone who that's a very interesting individual. For example, the one in the picture here is called Darwin Bark Spider, and it is known for extremely strong webs. Next, we put the spider to sleep, and we excise the silk gland from its abdomen. And this is how they look like under microscope. And it's truly a jeweler's job to excise these glands without damaging them, because obviously they're quite small, uh, depending on the size of the spider. Then they use a very clever technique, which is called RNA-seq, that basically allows us to read all protein coding genes within the silk gland. And then using a lot of bioinformatics and computational biology, we find the genes that encode for silks. Now, if someone in the audience is considering career in biology, I strongly urge you to consider bioinformatics because it's a super exciting area across very, across very many biological disciplines. But back to our genes, now that we've discovered and isolated the genes that code for spider silk, we take them out and insert them into microbes, for example, bacteria or yeast. And then we grow them in bioreactors that are basically very fancy and very scientific shakers. Bioreactors can get as big as th hundreds of thousands of tons. So that would make you a huge amount of silk, possibly tons of silk. Um, now, there's a huge variety of organisms that you could use in this process, not just sort of uh, microbes, but you could use um, baker's yeast, uh, so Saccharomyces cerevisiae, uh, as well as other popular type of yeast, Pistorius, 
but fermentations are not limited to these. So a silk can be made in salmonella, and it's a pathogenic organism normally, but we can engineer it to be sort of more friendly. You can make silk in green algae using photobioreactors that are basically these shake flasks with very big lumps. And spallosil has been made in plants, in insects, uh, and even mammals. You might have heard of silk goats. And more recently, there have been reports of transgenic, uh, transgenic sheep that make spider silk in their wool. Now, let's go back to my microbes uh, for, for a little moment. Now, we've grown our biomass in these super fancy shakers, and it's time to harvest them. And this is how pure bacteria made spider silk look like. Now, to me, it kind of looks like a web, but I'll leave it up to you. Now, from that white powder, you can make a lot of different materials, a lot of different morphologies. For example, you can make fibers for textiles. Uh, you can make sort of screens and coatings, as well as various gels. Now, two-dimensional cell support, uh, as a, for example, in the spider silk film, could help people grow flat tissue, for example, artificial skin. Three-dimensional cell support, like hydrogels and aerogels, could facilitate growth of stem cells into full organs, for example, artificial livers. Now, cells would sit inside the gel pores, and the silk would act as a scaffold and a nutrient delivery device. There are also colloidal drug delivery systems that are essentially protein spheres of various sizes, and the smallest of silk spheres can be loaded with drugs injected into a patient where they will deliver a drug to wherever it needs to be. Now, if you remember to the beginning of my talk, I said that silk is not immunogenic and, and biodegradable. And that's a very important aspect for any material you would put into a living system. Uh, I've made most of these materials myself and I'm quite proud of them as well. Now, thank you so much for listening for my very quick talk. Uh, I am, of course, extremely biased, but I personally think that silk is an awesome material. And making proteins in microbes is just about the best job uh, I could possibly wish for. Now, I know we have a lot of students in the audience, and I know that a lot of people think that uh, human medicine is the only career route for people interested in biology. But I hope today I managed to convey how many super exciting research areas are in the world, from exquisite computational biology to bioinformatics to synthetic biology, protein engineering, bioprospecting, and I haven't even scratched the surface. If I manage to get to your interest about spiders, I recommend the film called 16 Legs. And I also have written a little article called Futuristic Fibers that you can uh, see in The Biologist in June. Do give it a read. Again, thank you so much for your attention. If you would like to meet more biologists like myself, or if you're a teacher and you would like to advance your career through the RSB, please do get in touch with me. I'm the official RSB ambassador. Uh, these are our Twitter handles and my personal email. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Yolanta. That was absolutely fascinating, as expected. Um, can maybe we have um, questions in the chat? We've got time for um, for just a couple, and then we really we really need to move on to our other learned colleagues. So, if anyone has any questions, please enter them um, enter them in the chat. Got to give people time to type. Ah, what are the steps to purifying silk? So, depending on what sort of expression system you use, but if I were to purify silk from microbes from my E. coli, I would need to use something to break open the cell walls. So I would use ultrasound, or you could use soap. Soap breaks up bacteria very efficiently as well. Now we use different protein tags to purify protein. So my silk has uh, six uh, histidine uh, residues at the end of it. And histidines have natural affinity for nickel. So what I do, I take the protein solution and I put it to, through the column that contains nickel. And my, uh, and my protein of interest is retained in the column. So that's sort of a very uh, top overview for um, protein chromatography. Brilliant. Uh, we'll have another couple of questions. So, is there one species better than others tensile strength? Uh, yes, and not only one species are better than others, but also one type of silk within the same spider species is different from uh, the other. So, dragline silk is the strongest, 
um, silk. And so Darwin Parks by this drug line is the strongest known. Um, they vary a little bit in the amino acid composition, uh, but it's basically the abundance of glycines and alanines that make a strong fiber. Uh, final question. So how long does it take for silk to degrade in the human body? That's a very good question. Uh, silk has, so spider silk has not been uh, put into a human body as of now, so I haven't seen those reports. But in mice, it, um, the spider silk fibers were put into mice and they survived for a couple of years before degrading. Now, the important part about survival for a couple of years is that the silk was not encapsulated, so it was still available for degradation, so it was gradually going away. Whereas if you would put something that's like plastic into human body, it would be encapsulated and it would make a scar. But that's, that's the bad thing about it. Um, so yeah, there is, there is, um, you might have heard that in human medicine, uh, silkworm silk is sometimes used uh, for surgical sutures. And they also dissolve in sort of, uh, in weeks to months time. Okay, so plenty, plenty to think about for the future there. Thank you very much, Yolanta, and I'm sure we might have other people getting in touch with you with additional questions we haven't had time for today, but probably schedule. So thank you so much. Thank you, Yolanta. Thank you very much. So now, real pleasure to welcome David Young, one of our uh, one of our recent uh, uh, joiners to the committee. He's program leader for Biochem at uh, the University of Northampton, um, and he's a research fellow at Northampton General Hospital. So, David, over to you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Um, welcome, everybody. Great talk there by Yolanda. Always interesting to hear about arachnids, uh, even though I don't find them particularly nice. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about sepsis. Like Philippe said, I'm a lecturer at the University of Northampton, and I'm also a researcher at Northampton General Hospital. So we kind of work between uh, the two faculties and departments of pathology and biochemistry. Um, I would just very quickly like to say thank you to Rebecca Kane and Kyra for putting their tablets down for five minutes to allow me, allowing me for some bandwidth. Um, which I know I'm going to need for sharing this. So um, this talk is about sepsis. It's only going to be about 10 minutes long. Um, during this topic, we'll kind of cover what sepsis is and, and kind of where we're heading um, with it in terms of the future and also why it's such an issue really as well. OK, so you may have heard of sepsis before. Uh, you may not. Um, it's not typically something that's discussed a lot because it is a notoriously difficult disorder to get your head around. So we'll start off with what actually is sepsis. So sepsis is an autoimmune disease, which basically means it's your own immune system that attacks itself. OK, um, that means that the, the very immune system, the innate and the adaptive immune system that you have that is designed um, primarily to protect your body can no longer differentiate between foreign entities like pathogens, bacteria, viruses, fungus, etc., and the host um, cells. So that means it can't differentiate between the two. It goes into a, a hyperactive um, mode and it just attacks absolutely everything at the site of infection or trauma. Um, that means that a severe amount of damage can be done in a very little time. There are various means of initiation Okay, um, and that means basically you can have hospital acquired sepsis, you can have community acquired sepsis. So you can develop sepsis whilst you're in hospital having um, knee surgery, for example, or brain surgery, any type of surgery, having a bone fixed, for example. You can also develop sepsis at home, down the park, anywhere. Nowhere is out of bounds um, for sepsis development. Like I said, there there are a couple of ways in which it can start. So we have bacterial, viral and fungal infections. OK, we're, our body is covered in bacteria. Um, we're exposed to viruses and fungi all the time. Um, a prominent virus at the minute, obviously uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, as it's more frequently known. Um, and we are obviously covered in stuff like E. coli, Klebsiella, which are types of bacteria. Now, all of these can cause an infection 
which triggers this overactive immune response and, and begins sepsis. And now the problem that we've got is we don't actually know who is going to develop this and when it's going to develop. So it's it's quite, you know, a scary thing to think about. We also don't necessarily have to have uh, an infection. It can also be a blunt trauma. So a blunt trauma means um, an impact of some description. Now, this image here that I've just added, this is a good friend of mine called Johnny McCarthy. He's a, a lovely guy. He's he's from Liverpool, um, and his story is quite sorry, is quite a, a tragic, sorry one. Um, he went to the horse racing one day, and and this is just an explanation, like just a an idea of how easy and how un unsuspecting this can creep up on you. He went to the horse races one day, and he was walking through the paddocks, and he stepped to one side to let people come through. Um, and as he stepped to one side, he bumped his knee on the side of a fence. Um, no cut, no bruise, no real bruise anyway, uh, but no cut, no real damage uh, or what he thought. Now, I dare say everybody can say, oh yeah, I bumped my elbow on the stairs or I bumped my knee on the door or something like that. Literally, that is what happened to Johnny. Um, the next day he kind of woke up, he had quite a lot of severe symptoms of flu-like symptoms uh so he you know he was struggling with his breathing you know he felt really lethargic he kind of had a little bit of slur in his speech as as the weeks went on or the days went on and now they are all symptoms of other diseases slurred speech um signs of a stroke uh severe breathing pain whilst you're moving uh, not being able to pass wind could uh, pass uh, wind or past urine, they can be also signs of um, bowel issues and kidney issues. So sepsis really does deceive everybody in its early stages. Okay, but Johnny, he got polio and polio, um, and he went to hospital um, just feeling like he had a flu, like a really bad bad flu. He didn't even think that he should go to hospital. Six weeks later, he woke up from an intensive care stay. So he was in intensive care for six weeks. And where he had bumped his knee um, on the fence, you can see he's in a motorized scooter now, they had to amputate his leg. So from the knee down, he had lost his leg. Um, and that was just from bumping his knee on a wooden fence. No bacterial infection. It was just a minor trauma, which is why sepsis is so scary, because it literally can affect anybody anytime. And we still don't really understand why that is. So Johnny, when he was in hospital, he went into intensive care and he went into what we call septic shock, which means his blood pressure dropped dramatically. So a real severe drop in blood pressure meant that lactic acid levels could rise. So serum lactate could rise. Uh, there's other mediators as well that begin to rise as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. But essentially what happens is when the lactate acid level rises, it means that your organs aren't using oxygen in the body properly. And that means if they're not getting enough oxygen, they can't produce enough energy. And what we end up with is we end up with sequential organ failure. Um, so typically the kidneys are the first to go, uh, followed by the liver, maybe the pancreas. So it's very, very debilitating. So just to give you some statistics of this being a bigger problem than just the odd account, Every three seconds, somebody in the world dies of sepsis, and we don't really know who it's going to be. Um, so this talk is 10 minutes long. That means from start to finish of this talk, 200 people in the world would have died of sepsis, which is, which is a lot of people. Globally, sepsis claims up to 11 million lives. That's nearly 50 million cases per year. 11, 11 million people die, typically in poorer countries where the healthcare system isn't so good. But this image here, for the football fans of you, um, this is the Etihad Stadium. This is Manchester City Football Club's home stadium. Now, if you just have a little look around there, there's around 50,000 people in that ground. Um, that is an awful lot of people. And that just happens to be the amount of people that die in the UK alone from sepsis. Anywhere between 37,000 um, to 50, 40,000. Now we're kind of getting towards the 50,000 a year. Um, and it's predicted to exceed that over the next five years if we really don't start researching this um, it could be anywhere up to 60 70 000. that is a lot of people um, 50 000 a year 
dying of sepsis is more than breast cancer, bowel cancer, and pancreatic cancer combined. Okay, so it's an, a, 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 an awful amount of people that are losing their lives. So let's just have a look at some of the finer details around sepsis. There are many, many molecules that play a role in developing sepsis. Uh, inflammation markers, um, so kinins, thrombin, pro, procalcitonin is a big key player. So we can kind of measure what happens with the the levels of which these molecules go up and down and they fluctuate um, but there doesn't seem to be one central mediator this is one of the problems with sepsis um, we don't have a particular hallmark if you like so a particular hallmark of cancer would be metastases okay uh, or angiogenesis uh, with growing new veins so it can feed itself that is a hallmark of cancer we don't necessarily have a hallmark of sepsis. So it's a really murky area and everybody is completely different. There is this molecule here called TNFA, which is tumor necrosis factor alpha. Now that has been proposed to have this central role, but again, it's still not in everybody. So it really is a case of not having a single pathogenic mechanism. It is not just if you get this bacteria, you get sepsis. It is more a triggering of lots and lots of internal pathways within your body. Now we do have um, means of stopping this within the body. So typically when we um, have a, an increase in procalcitonin, for example, and we go into sepsis, um, we have inflammation occurring around our cells and we do have natural um, inflammation inhibitors such as interleukin four and eight. Where, when you develop sepsis and you start leading towards sepsis, septic shock, they get completely downregulated or, or stopped in some cases, which means you have absolutely no control over the inflammation that occurs around your cells. The cells then go into apoptosis, which is cell suicide, um, and they start to die rapidly. And if that is in, a, in an essential organ, that organ goes into organ failure. Okay, so exceptionally exceptionally detailed and very sparse okay um so this is a typical immune response that i've got here so you can see this little circle gray ball that's for example a uh, a bacteria for example let's say this is klebsiella pneumoniae uh, and you can see here we've got igg this is immunoglobulin gamma so these are antibodies that float around your body they stick to pathogens bacteria, for example and they kind of set off a beacon saying hey this guy shouldn't be here come and destroy it okay for example a phagocyte so a macrophage for example can stick okay one minute can stick to the um bacteria uh, and engulf it and we're really working around this fc gamma receptor one at the minute uh, with the hospital and university which is an activatory receptor which kind of looks like this funky image here on the right so that's where we're working on at the minute now before Philippe cuts me off and I um, I have to rush. I do just want to talk about one last thing. It's called post-sepsis syndrome. So at the University of Northampton, Rachel Evenden, one of our psychologists, runs a support group uh, for people that survive sepsis. And typically they have these kind of physiological or physical and psychological and physiological um, situations. Uh, incidences that occur uh, particularly nightmares is a bad one where you can't differentiate between nightmares and uh, reality which is obviously a real bad thing um, what does the future hold i have to be very careful here because i'm running out of time and i'm not allowed to talk about too much um, but we have apache and sofa scores you start with broad spectrum antibiotics to contain your body and then it's kind of trial and error antibiotics but we are aiming to get towards personalized medicine and creating a patient sepsis profile which should save lots of lives thank you very much philippe apologies if i've ran over any questions very good at the very good at the one minute notice I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> I, I, I saw I saw you going like this and I thought oh have I said something I shouldn't have I thought you was wagging your finger at me <laughs> if, if every conference I chaired had uh, had speakers who finished as soon as I put my face up that would be brilliant but uh, anyway
anyway so can we have we've not got a wonderful amount of time for questions unfortunately but if we can have uh, a couple in the um uh in the chat that would be absolutely great and then we'll move on to our final speaker hannah So one question, is there a genetic vulnerability that we know of to sepsis? Uh, very good question. The answer is no at the minute um, because we don't know of any. Currently, we are testing some immune genes and they are for FC receptors. And we are also looking at defensins, which are another molecule that plays a role in, um, in the uh, defense of sepsis. So currently not unfortunately but genetics is where we are heading genetics and bioinformatics is really where we're heading with it so genomics as well i'm assuming yeah yeah okay and so what another question from jane why are the numbers going up uh that is a really good question um the numbers are going up really because we're living longer um, so anyone post 75, typically 20, 30 years ago, wouldn't have even been admitted to hospital. Um, and secondly, we now are starting to def de kind of identify what sepsis is. Um, so a bit like uh, when we have hallmarks for cancer, for example, we would put on the death certificate, this person passed away of cancer. Now we are actually starting to identify sepsis and sepsis related illness as a marker for death. So it would be introduced. So if that person died of, for example, um, fluid on the lungs, that would have been what they would have been classed as, but now it's sepsis induced um, uh, fluid on the lungs so it's it is slightly deceiving uh, we're just getting a better handle on what it actually is and i guess touch base in in a year and then in five years and see what uh, what more we know absolutely superb thank you so much david a really no fascinating presentation i'm sorry i had to waggle the finger <laughs> that's okay <laughs> so final but certainly last but not least today we have hannah uh, hannah Betts is a second year uh, PhD student at the University of Nottingham in the School of Chemistry uh, and she's working on DNA repair in humans and she's also the RSB East Midlands Instagram page manager. So over to you. Hello, just share my screen and make sure you can see it. Is that full screen for everybody? Can you all see that? Not yet. Not yet for me, Hannah. Ah, do you know why that is? That's because I just changed the window and didn't actually click share my screen. Okay, <laughs> how about now? Uh, not quite. Oh, oh yes. Yes. yes, there we go. Brilliant, go and for it. Full screen now. Perfect, right, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. So hi everybody, uh, my name is Hannah. As Philippe has just said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Nottingham. Uh, I usually spend my time working on DNA repair in humans, uh, but today I'm gonna to talk you through a really interesting and really quite rare condition uh, called Bloom syndrome. So firstly, I'm gonna show you a really big list of symptoms, all of this. So we've got skin lesions, problems with DNA repair, insulin resistance that looks a bit like diabetes, stunted growth and a great increased risk of developing cancers. Now this seems like an enormous list of symptoms and actually all of them can be caused by just one tiny mistake in just one piece of DNA. So how on earth can a change so seemingly small create such enormous effects in the body? You probably already know from lessons that DNA is transcribed to make RNA and the RNA is translated to produce proteins which are sort of like strings of amino acids arranged into 3D structures. But sometimes, when DNA is being transcribed, the wrong base is incorporated into the DNA sequence. Remember, the bases are the four main components that make up our DNA and code for all of the proteins in the human body. And for short, we call them A, C, T, and G. So, whereas we see on the top sequence, it reads T, A, A, C, T, and so on, a mistake has led to the copied sequence reading TAACC. Three bases come together to form one amino acid. And this means 
that when translated into a protein, the amino acid sequence would originally give a leucine residue here as CTG, but instead as CCG, it's a proline residue. And the 3D arrangement of proteins depends very much on the original primary sequence of amino acids. And any changes can often change the way that the protein folds into its 3D shape and change how it functions in the body. So DNA is transcribed to RNA and is translated to protein. And proteins, again, are a 3D arrangement of a string of amino acids, such as hemoglobin, the protein which carries oxygen around our blood. And proteins vary massively in the number of amino acids that make them up. Tiny ones exist of around a dozen or so amino acids, and the largest ever, which is called Titan, has the biggest, and it's over 34,000 amino acids long. And all of the proteins that are made in a species are collectively known as the proteome. And the human proteome is immensely complex. It's made up of between 80,000 and 400,000 proteins that have vital roles in biological processes. They interact with other proteins and keep us ticking even when we don't realize. And virtually everything that goes on in our bodies to keep us alive and well has a protein helping it out. And they're incredibly capable and clever, but also very, very fragile. So DNA mistakes, like the one I've just shown you, can happen all of the time. And if the DNA is wrong, so is the protein. Now, our cells have some proteins called polymerases, which are responsible for pulling together all of the new bases when a DNA strand is made. And they have what's called proofreading activity. This means that the polymerase can check the basis is added to a new strand and make sure it's the right one. But the misincorporation of bases, like I showed you before, is not the only way that DNA can become damaged or non-functional. And remember, if the DNA is wrong in any way, so too will the RNA be, and so will the protein. So let's look at an example where this is the case. This is the Bloom protein. So we spell it as BLM, but pronounce it as Bloom. Um, and it may look really complicated, but like I said, it's actually just a long string of amino acids all wound up together. And they form a protein called a helicase. Helicases that you might remember from lessons are the proteins responsible for pulling apart two strands of DNA, allowing them to be copied. And think of helicases like a zip separating each side. So rather than thinking about this big complicated diagram on the left, we can just think of it like this. So the helicase is the zipper itself, gradually moving along double-stranded DNA and leaving two single strands behind. This leaves the DNA exposed and lets it be copied. So the cell can make more identical copies of this DNA. So let's briefly come back to this list of symptoms. You remember at the start, I said that one tiny mistake in one specific piece of DNA can lead to all of these downstream effects. We then went on to talk about how, because proteins are made from the blueprints that RNA provides, which are in turn copied from the DNA, how if the DNA is wrong, so is the RNA and so is the protein. And when proteins have mutations, they often can't function as they should. And so this is what's happened in our bloom protein, a mutation that changes its final shape and function. And this causes a disease called bloom syndrome. So. Somewhere in this complex green bit, the red and purple bits are just DNA, uh, there's been a mutation that causes Bloom syndrome. And we don't actually know what the specific mutation is that causes all of these uh, symptoms of the condition. It could be a mutation here or here or here or really anywhere. We're not sure yet. But what we do know is that it's autosomal recessive. So this mutation has to appear in both alleles. Much like blue eyes, for example, both of your parents would have to have a mutant copy for you to have a chance of developing this. However, we do know that one change, a deletion and insertion at amino acid 2,281, so about here in the red circle, is responsible for a prevalence of the disease among the Ashkenazic Jewish population. And once upon a time, this group of people only formed families with others who were of the same descent, and this reduced genetic variation among the population and means, meant that the two recessive alleles were far more likely to come together. But how does a mutant protein like this cause all of the symptoms I showed you? Well, we touched on helicases like Bloom being able to unzip DNA, allowing it to be copied when the DNA is being replicated. However, helicases also help in repairing DNA when it breaks or is otherwise damaged. So if our Bloom protein has been damaged because of a mutation, it's unable to do this repairing job properly. If it can't detect damage when it occurs, it can't put in place the processes to correct it. So here we see the wild type blue protein and wild type just means that the protein is functioning happily and as normal. And it runs along and sees if there's any damage in this nice healthy DNA. And there's no problem. So the helicase doesn't raise any alarms. Here, 
the DNA is damaged. So there's a chemical modification stuck to one of the bases, and that's represented by this little black box here. And this T base will struggle to bind its partner in the double strand form. The fully functioning wild type bloom can recognize this and signal to the cell that there's a mistake that needs fixing. But if, like we talked about, a mutation has arisen in the bloom protein such that it isn't functioning properly, it might not be able to recognize the damage when it passes it. So we've got this rather sickly looking green mutant protein and it travels along the DNA and doesn't recognize the damage at all and just signals that everything's fine. So because it can't signal there's a problem, it can't initiate the repair processes and the damage stays. An unresolved DNA damage excuse me, can be fatal to the cell. For example, it can prevent proper DNA replication and copying from occurring as it should. And this can prevent appropriate mitosis or cell division. So now let's return to the enormous list of symptoms I showed you at the start. So all of this back here. DNA damage can't be recognized by a malfunctioning bloom protein. And so this causes, like I said, DNA repair defects, replication problems, and chromosome breakages. This also leads to less effective cell division, which would account for the slower growth and the smaller head circumference. And another common form of DNA damage is UV radiation. And this is the reason that too much sunbathing can give you skin cancer. So you've got an increased exposure to UV radiation, which damages the DNA. And more radiation means there's a higher chance that not all of the damage can be repaired. So a failure to recognize some damage leads to sun sensitivity, as well as lesions, discolorations, and rashes. And this malfunction also causes downstream damage in the systems of the human body, namely the endocrine and immune systems. This leads firstly to diabetes like insulin resistance and decreased appetite, but also a much higher chance of developing infections and general immune deficiency. We're not actually sure what causes the male infertility in cases of Bloom syndrome, but we do know what causes the cancer risk. So cancer can simply be defined as cell division occurring in an uncontrolled manner. So a defective Bloom helicase can't detect the DNA damage properly when it sees it, and the damage goes unprepared, unrepaired. Sorry. Replication can be prevented or altered in such a way that stops mitosis from happening normally. Cells aren't dividing properly, and the risk of cancer is greatly increased. And that's how one tiny change in DNA can create devastating effects in the human body. So just finally, remember how at the beginning I told you that all of the proteins that make up the human proteome and how just one tiny difference in just the bloom protein can create all of those problems. So there's a saying known as Murphy's Law, which basically states that if something can go wrong, it's almost definitely going to go wrong. And there are lots of other proteins just for DNA repair alone in the proteome. And any one of these could be susceptible to a similar mutation with devastating effects. For example, as part of my research, I work with a DNA repair helicase called HellQ. And we don't know quite so much about HellQ as we do Bloom, but we do know that when this protein is absent from mice, they get a lot more tumors and a lot more fertility problems. HellQ seems to work in a similar way to Bloom. So who knows how many other diseases and proteins have yet to be discovered and how much more we can advance in medicine by learning as much as we can about our bodies and what makes them work. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit more about mutations and the effects it can have on the body. Uh, good luck in your exams. Thank you, Hannah. Utterly mm -hmm. fascinating as expected. So any, um, any questions in the chat? We've got a few minutes um, to, uh, to bring those up. So um, one question, Hannah, are he Uh, sorry, Philippe, you cut out a bit there. Could you repeat that? Oh, sorry. Um, are helicases ATP-dependent proteins? Uh, short answer, yes, they are, yes. Um, so when we... Very good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, for example, in HellQ, we can generate a mutant that changes one amino acid, and it means that it can't actually be uh, stimulated by ATPase, and the whole helicase just goes, pfft, it doesn't work properly. So yes, they are absolutely dependent on the actions of ATP. So another question is how, uh, how can you compare amino acid sequence of a normal and a mutated helicase protein? Um, so we do this by a very similar technique that Yolanta suggested at the beginning of her talk with um, DNA sequencing. So what we're able to do is take the cells that we think might have a mutant protein and we can you know, take all the DNA out of it, scrap all of the other elements of the cell and we can send it off and some other fancy people that do some other smart things do some very clever things with machinery and they send us back a long list of just the bases and then we can 
uh, have a look through them and match up all the bases to the amino acids and compare it to what it should be and see if there are any mistakes. So, uh, final question, because I'm conscious of time. How is Bloom's disease diagnosed considering a wide range of symptoms? Uh, it's actually really difficult to diagnose because the condition is so, so, so rare. I think there are only about 300 cases, if that, um, reported basically ever. Um, but because it's so complicated, it would have to be diagnosed with basically by um, uh, taking uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, samples and actually looking at the makeup of the chromosomes. It can't really be diagnosed in any other way because there are so many symptoms and they all could be indicative of so many diseases. Brilliant. So what a, what a high to finish on. Um, I, I think we've we've really uh, sort of catalyzed on um, what our expectations are of British Science Week by having three exceptional talks. Um, thank you to everyone who has um, contributed and to the committee who have um, set it up. Uh, Rosemary, I don't know whether you wanted to say anything else. I'm going to have to log off in one minute because I have a meeting starting. Um, but uh, I'll leave it. I'll leave it to all of you. But thank you so so much for these talks. I've certainly had fun during my lunchtime, which I don't often do. Um, so a round of applause for everyone behind the muted microphones, no doubt. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Philippe, and good luck with what you're going to now. I know how busy you are. Um, Really, really inspiring talks. Well done, everybody. Thoroughly enjoyed them. My husband's sitting next to me as well, hidden away, and um, he's nodding and remembering things that he used to be involved with as well, as I'm sure some other people that have joined us are. Um, I hope um, all of you students have enjoyed and seen the links with some of the work that you do at school with um, these uh, amazing talks that have been done. Sorry, we're very short of time, but um, certainly next week when all is back to some sort of normality and that you're back to school, um, we really would only be able to use um, the hour for the lunchtime, the hour overall. But um, thank you very much, um, the three speakers. Thank you all for coming. And um, I um, hope that we see uh, a lot of you again next week. I'm just going to remind you what's coming up on Monday. Dr. Laura Barter from Imperial College London is doing her talk on agri-science chemical biology. So um, I have heard Laura speak before and I think her talk will illustrate the interdependence of the different sciences and different branches as in some respects, the talks, of course, today have as well, very much so. And um, certainly there will be some emphasis on uh, her work with plants. And um, so I think it should be very, very interesting. She has some industrial um, expertise as well. So her talk, as I say, agri-science, chemical biology um, on Monday lunchtime.